Hello, my name is James Klinger. I'm a doctor of pulmonary medicine at Rhode Island Hospital and Brown University. And I'm here today with Robert France, who's professor of medicine in the Department of Cardiovascular Diseases at the Mayo Medical School and director of the pulmonary hypertension clinic there. And today we're going to talk a little bit about combination therapy and how to use them in our treatments for patients with pulmonary hypertension. Bob, thanks for joining us today. Can you tell us a little bit about what is meant by combination therapy? Well, thanks very much, Jim. It's great to have a chance to chat. The concept here has been that pulmonary arterial hypertension therapies kind of grew up in silos when there was nothing to treat this condition other than parenteral, uh, epoprostenol. When other agents started coming along, they were compared generally against placebo. For example, we were starting to use sildenafil as a treatment for pulmonary arterial hypertension before it really was even certain that it was effective and we're just giving sort of off-label Viagra. And then as we started to have these differing agents, then the question was whether they might be helpful to use in combination. And I, I suppose we took our lead from the left heart failure world that way, where we know that we build therapy with ACE inhibitors and beta blockers and aldosterone antagonists in a sequential way that then optimizes outcome by having multiple neurohumeral effects in heart failure. And of course, in pulmonary hypertension, we've, we've known about the PD-5 inhibitors and, and that pathway of the nitric oxide pathway. And then Bocentan came along as a, a first-in-class endothelin receptor antagonist that was compared against placebo. And so then people thought maybe it's better to treat two pathways than one. And so the the historic way we treated PAH, if you didn't need parenteral prostenoids, was generally to start an oral agent, either a PD-5 inhibitor or Bocentan, which was our first endothelin antagonist. And then if treatment goals weren't being met, to add the other type of, of agent as a sequential therapy to try to optimize outcome. And with the idea, you know, you could say, why didn't you just switch from one to the other? If it didn't get the effect you wanted with one, just stop it and start the other. But generally with a sense in such a severe disease that hopefully the first drug was having some impact, but maybe not enough, and then adding the other therapy. And then, of course, once we had various forms of other prostenoids, including inhaled initially iloprost and then inhaled triprostenil, then we could add something other than a parenteral prostenoid to either an ERA or a PD-5. So that's sort of the historical perspective. And Jim, I'm sure you remember the days when we didn't really have any randomized data about this, but we would add another drug and then someone would, would publish a case series of their last 20 patients who had Bocentan added to sildenafil or something of the type, demonstrating a nice improvement in walk and so forth. And Nobody knew whether that was for sure correct or if it was just a placebo effect of getting a second agent. So that's sort of the, the history of, of the sequential approach to combination therapy. Yeah, I think that's right. We were always very concerned to stop any therapy that somebody was on when they didn't get better because we didn't know if they'd actually be getting worse had they not been on the therapy. Do you think any of these drugs that we have are designed to work in combination with each other, or do you think it's just a matter of the more drugs we use, the better chance we have of finding one that will work? You know, my own sense is that there may be some level of synergy of some crosstalk, for example, between the nitric oxide and endothelin pathways where combination therapy could have a greater effect than either one alone. And I, I do think that some of it may be that in the given patient, we just don't know which pathway is the better one to attack, and, and that explains some of it. But I must say, I think that, that there may be some synergistic effect as, as well. And of course, the historic sequential therapy has so often been a PD-5 and an ERA in either sequence. And then we had the other ERAs come along, Ambrosentan and then more recently, Massey Tentan, and also Tadalafil as an alternative PD-5 inhibitor and had to start thinking about which combinations made more sense than, than others. And, of course, the empiric use of sequential combination therapy led to the desire to have randomized trials that ended up getting us the COMPASS-2 uh, study, which was basically adding uh, Bocentan to a PD-5 inhibitor and subsequent trials of ambrosentan as monotherapy 
and or as combination therapy that we'll talk about as we move forward with our discussion today. No, I think that's uh, very interesting. I mean, one of the things I always thought that was interesting is that the endothelial receptor antagonists are really the only group of drugs that we have that prevent or inhibit vasoconstrictors, whereas the other agents are vasodilators. So at least intuitively, there's this kind of nice idea if you could use in combination a drug that caused vasodilation along with another drug that inhibited vasoconstriction, maybe you'd get uh, more bang for your buck. Um, you know, some of the newer drugs that we have uh, that have come out recently have been done in this kind of sequential add-on fashion. Like you were saying, it used to be we try a new drug versus nothing, um, but now we see a lot of trials where the new drugs are added to either background therapy or, or uh, patient-naive therapy. Are some of these new trials what you would consider to be sequential add-on combination therapy? Yeah, I mean, for sure, certainly the COMPASS-2 trial was that way, where patients had to be established on, on a PD-5 inhibitor and then receive placentan or placebo, and also the study of um, mastitentan as add-on therapy was studied in the Serafin study, and those patients could be naive or could be on a PD-5 inhibitor, and so that trial kind of got two for one that way in terms of both showing efficacy and, and treatment naive patients and also having the opportunity to really, in a randomized sense, look at the response to somebody already on a, a PD-5 inhibitor. So, But again, a, a sequential type of a, approach to therapy where you pick one drug and then add another, and I think that the concept of upfront combination came partly from the idea of what was sort of retrospective looking at sequential combination therapy trials where it seemed like people that were randomized to the placebo arm of a sequential trial never necessarily caught up to those who got started on the newer agent as part of the initial randomization where this idea is once the genie is out of the bottle and pH in terms of the right ventricle and deterioration, sometimes hard to get the genie back in the bottle. And so that became the idea really behind the ambition study, which was truly upfront combination therapy with ambrosentan and tadalafil. And the other arms were randomized to one or the other as monotherapy. And indeed, the, the upfront combination of tadalafil and ambrosentan was a potent combination compared to either agent alone. And with this hope that maybe pH thinking of of it's sort of in a cancer modality, we're better to hit it harder up front than to give something, see if patients deteriorate or not, or get better or not, and then add something later. Yeah, that was an impressive study. It's interesting that both the um, monotherapy arms in that study looked very similar to each other, and then the combination therapy up front looked like it had a, a superior effect. Knowing that kind of data, are there certain patients nowadays that you think are better served by upfront combination therapy or just the opposite? Are there some patients we should be looking at who may not derive full benefit from upfront combination therapy? Yeah, I think it's a good question, Jim. In my mind, the majority of patients with PAH likely should get close to upfront combination therapy. And whether that's completely upfront where truly they're starting the same uh, day on two different agents versus a staging of a week or two or a few weeks to sort of get one under the wing um, maybe isn't critically important as opposed to what we used to do, which is, well, we'll see you back in three months, and if you're getting worse, maybe we'll add something then, which is not the way we're commonly doing things now. So I think that the patients where I might go with monotherapy might be an older patient who's got an element of left heart disease that is controlled, but where you're worried if you use an endothelin antagonist, they're going to retain fluid and not do as well, and maybe their pH isn't quite so severe, so maybe you give them a PD-5 alone and, and watch them closely. So that's maybe one patient I might think about, or somebody who's just not very advanced at all. But the thing is, we've, we've had a hard time to figure out, so sort of functional class two patients who seem relatively compensated, they still seem to benefit in terms of these clinical trials of combination therapy. So it's been hard to find a patient that's so mild that truly we believe they're going to do fine just with monotherapy. Yep. Any potential downsides for using two drugs up front? Well, you could see in the ambition study that there definitely was more trouble with headache and, and some side effects with the combination, nasal congestion, things of that type. 
and then try to ferret out which drug is causing the problem if you really do start both simultaneously. So I think there is going to be a little bit more side effect thing to pay for it. And the dropout rate was really quite low in, in ambition. And, and so there's probably not too much downside and probably more benefit than there is downside in that regard. And then, of course, with the Griffin study, which was Selexapag, this selective IP receptor agonist, or the first-in-class drug of, of an uh, oral agent that would accomplish that, those patients could be on monotherapy background or dual therapy background, and, and indeed about a third of patients in that study were on dual oral background therapy with a PD-5 and ERA, and they still derive benefit, and that's now becoming triple therapy, you know, and so... I think we worry about other things such as cost and are we over-treating, but that's usually not our concern in PAH that we're over-treating uh, for most of these patients. Um, and there's this question of is there a downside to it? For example, the Triton study is looking at upfront triple therapy with a PD-5 ERA with either selexapag or a placebo. That approach will really be interesting in terms of whether upfront triples is, is better than the sequential things we're doing now. Yeah, I think that's going to be very interesting, and obviously it'll take a little while for us to uh, figure that out. Any last thoughts on where you think this field of combination therapy is headed? Well, I think it's just a trend that has been repeatedly positive in terms of going this way, and I would say that, uh, of course, we should mention the sort of upfront triples that included parenteral prostenoids uh, that have been reported in about 18 patients where quite advanced patients that clearly need parenteral prostenoids who all got triple therapy in rapid order and only one out of 18 ended up needing lung transplant over the next six months. And so there's this concept of being continually more aggressive about combination therapy. We should also just mention the PACES study, which was adding uh, sildenafil to uh, epoprostenol, and indeed that combination seemed proper and, and effective with regard to additional benefit, and so we often do that. And the concept of the inhaled therapies where we very rarely would use an inhaled therapy by itself without some kind of background oral agent, such addition of either inhaled iloprost or, or uh, inhaled treprostenil to oral agents, which can be a nice approach in patients who tend to have headaches or things of that type and don't tolerate parenteral prostenoids well or aren't candidates for it. So I would just sort of conclude that combination therapy and increasingly upfront combination therapy is the trend, and I suspect it will continue. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, I think there's fairly good data out there that shows that people that are not meeting their treatment goals on monotherapy frequently will improve with the addition of a second agent. And I think now with the ambition study, we have data suggesting that it's probably a good idea to start treatment naive patients with upfront combination therapy. And then, of course, we'll have to await the results of future trials to see whether or not triple therapy has the same benefit. Well, Bob, I want to thank you again for joining us today. It's been very insightful. Hope to talk to you again soon. Well, thanks so much. It's been great, Jim.